I'm so excited, but humble before God. When you walked into this place, how many of you realize you just gave God permission to do surgery? How many of you ready for surgery? There is no anesthesia. He just does the work, I don't know. Because he's close to the brokenhearted. So I'm continuing on this uh, message. We, we, I thank Pastor Ryan for this series um, on walking with God by faith. And what I'm finding, even in preparing for this, it is a very humbling thing to walk with God. Because we are serving. I don't know if you realize this, but you are worshiping. You're seeing what God is doing. But we are worshiping an almighty God, the God of the heavens and the earth, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He is everything to us. Amen. He is everything to us. And we're following the, the story of Joshua, which was really, really powerful. And we ended last week talking about the Jordan River and how that was a tremendous miracle of about 30 miles dried up riverbed so that two plus million people and all of their cattle, every their, all their possessions could cross over. And they're right now in front of Jericho. It's really a great city, isn't it? Well, it's not going to be in a minute. So we're gonna, we're gonna basically cover a good part of two chapters, Ch Joshua chapter six. And by the way, the, uh, the theme verse for this is in Hebrews 11. It's just one verse that says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Lord, why do I have to march around them for seven days? Just command them to come down now. It's your will, right? How many of you know God has a plan for your life and he wants you to do it his way? That our way always seems to taint God's move in our lives. So let's pick it up in Joshua chapter six. It'll be on your screen. Here's the Lord's instructions. It says, now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut up, shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. How many of you would be afraid if you saw the rivers part the way it did and his whole nation comes across and it's right before your city? No one was allowed to go out or in, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times, with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. What I find fascinating is that when we look at the walls, actual walls of Jericho, it has been said that the foundation is upwards of 50 feet thick on the wall holding a wall that is about 10 to 30, 20, 10, 25 feet wide at any point. And it stands about 30 foot high. That's quite a wall. How many of you know God can do it? How many of you know we have a lot of walls that are pretty thick inside of us, that we, you know, they're come, coming against us, you know, that God wants to do a deliverance work inside of us, that he wants us to purify ourselves and to consecrate ourselves because he wants to do great things. It's what he said to Joshua when they came in and they were ready to go. It says, so Joshua called together the priests and said, take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave the orders to the people, march around the town, and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. So verse 8 says, and after Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horns started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and some behind the ark with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do, you, do not shout, don't even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout. Then shout. 
So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. <laughs> I just love that. All right, he just says, I just want you to walk around once. The whole nation, walk around, all right? What was interesting when I researched this, Jer Jericho in and of itself is only about eight or nine acres. It's a very small city. So it is theorized that they could walk around the city within 30 minutes to an hour. Now what are we gonna do? Okay, but just imagine two things. What the Israelites must have been thinking, we're just walking around, that's it. Don't say, no, 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 say anything. Just walk, all right? Because God's gonna do something, right? So they go back to the camp and they're probably wondering, what is God up to? All right, now, guess what does? Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark, the Lord blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. <laughs> second day, third day, fourth day. They followed this pattern, it says, for six days. And on the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout! Ready, for, ready to shout? That's okay, we don't have to do that. <laughs> for the Lord has given you the town. So we go to verse 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats, and donkeys. That is a tremendous feat. But one of the things I want us to understand is the number seven, it just seems really perfect, doesn't it? It's the number of God, it's the number of completeness. Because we see seven priests with seven trumpets or ram's horns, we see seven days and seven circuits of the wall on the seventh day. It just so happens that God wants it done the way that he wants it done. Amen. We remove ourselves from it, we just follow the Lord's commands. And this is with any situation in life. I know this is an Old Testament story, but I gotta tell you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I don't know, somebody said that last week. And we have walls in our lives, and we have things in our lives that God is going to bring down so that we can be free to be with him. And that's the whole point of walking around the walls. It's obedience before God. This isn't a military conquest, folks. It's a religious one. So here we pick it up in Joshua chapter six, verse 17. Here's the command that was supposed to happen. It said, Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble in the camp of Israel. Everything made of silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. I was kind of curious about that because you know what? Every other town, they were allowed to take the plunder, but Jericho, they were not. And you know what I found when I read about that? It was the first fruits of the Lord. Do you know how important that is in our lives? That we give our first fruits to him. That we dedicate things to him. And when Jericho was there, that was what he was proclaiming, is that Jericho is mine. It goes into my treasury. It will be used. And so it is significant that what Achan did as a sin by taking the devoted things was a very serious thing before the Lord. So here's takeaway number one. Very important. God's word is not a power trip for him. <laughs> God is not Sydney interested in making sure he looks good, although he can be glorified through everything he does, right? 
It is a guide, though, for holiness, health, and a way for us to prosper and to be with him. When we obey the word, it is to prosper us. Obeying it brings success and joy. Why? Because he knows more than we do. Do you know everything that's going to happen? Do you know how to handle every situation in your life? I know my God does. And he is here to help us with that. Secondly, he sees everything. He sees everything we can't see. And then next, he has a plan for our lives that is greater than anything we could think or imagine. We are sitting here today, God's people, and you are subject of God because he loves you and cares for you and wants the best for you. And so we have to not do it our own way, but do it his way. Can you imagine, think, just think of allowing a seven-year-old to run your household. What would that look like? <laughs> you just say to your child, okay, you got control of the house. You do the bills. You go to work. You go grocery shopping. You do everything. We're just going to trust you with that. What do you think is going to happen to the household? It's probably going to fall apart. Why is that? Because they don't have the maturity, they don't have the experience, they don't have the, 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 the ability to do what we do. And you as a parent is gonna stand by and just wanna intervene. I just want to carry that, don't spill that. You know when you try to trust a child, you know, because you gotta let them do it. But then think of what God has to go through when God has a specific plan to do things and then all of a sudden we take it over because we know better. And God's going, don't do it that way. Seven times, walk around the wall. It may not make sense to you, but God said to do it. And this is the interesting thing that I think is powerful. It's like we don't have to understand to, to do it because it is a guide for our lives for success. Amen? We are children of God and our Father knows best. Here's some examples. You know, how many love the word? I just love the word. I've studied it for years. But it is powerful to live by. Here's an example. Let's take anger. Anybody here ever get anger? No. Okay, I'll skip that one. When God says, in your anger, do not sin, do not sin while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold, he wants your anger not to take hold of you because he knows the devil will take hold. He wants us to treat each other with kindness and compassion for one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. He wants everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become what? For, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. God has a plan for our emotions. Amen? How about marriage? If you're married here today, God has a plan for you too. It says in Ephesians 5, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. It also says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5.33, however, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. But here's a sobering view. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. I'm gonna tell you today that we need to love one another. We need to get rid of stuff that is coming against our marriage covenant. We need to deal with marriage in the right way. We need not mistreat each other. We don't need domestic violence as a stain within the church church. We need people that can love one another and you can disagree to disagree and you can deal with your disagreements. Amen? Amen? How about relationships? Does God give us direction in relationships? It says this is the message I, you heard from the beginning. We should love one another if we want to. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves if they treat you right. Doesn't say that, does it? 
Romans 12, 13, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is one thing Jesus did, is that he did not overcome evil with evil, he overcame evil with good. He gave his, only, he gave his life for us so that we could learn how not to turn the other cheek and we could learn how to forgive one another and we could clear that because I'm gonna tell you something. What happens is if we don't have forgiveness in our relationships and we harbor resentment and bitterness, the God of this universe can't have the power to help you. It's getting rid of whatever we need to get rid of. Amen? Amen. I could go on, but I won't on that particular point. How about finances? Trusting in the Lord. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse if you have it. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Did you do my notes yesterday? It's like you messed them up somehow. (laughs) Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much a blessing that you will not have room to contain it. It is the one time that God says, test me in this. And this is one way that God says, I will prosper you. Just listen to what I say. March around the wall seven times. But Lord, I'm tired. I don't understand why we're doing it. I'm listening to my neighbor grumbling and complaining because I don't know why we're doing what we're doing. And God just simply says, just do it. Just do it. That's not a Nike commercial either. (laughs) Second Corinthians 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that's just a few ideas of how the word works. The word works. But we've got to plant it inside of us. Amen? Let's take a look at what happens when we don't do what God wants us to do. So the next city after Jericho is Ai. And Ai is a smaller city. And so it says in Joshua 7, verse 2, Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near beth When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. Since there are so few of them, don't make all the people struggle to go up there. (laughs) He's like, hey, we got this. You know, we're just going to look at it and just do it it ourselves. Hey, we don't have to ask God. We're just going to do it ourselves. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent and they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events and their courage melted away. It's almost as if, you know, they sensed that God wasn't with them. What happened? I don't understand, Lord. But here's what happened. The reason for the failure is in verse one of Joshua seven. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Camry, the descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. And so they failed, right? So isn't it typical? Now, here's Joshua, just like Moses. They're human, right? But how many of us have the same response when something doesn't go the the way we want it to go? In verses six to nine of Joshua seven, it says, Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay. They threw dust on their heads and bowed face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Then Joshua cried out, O sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan if you're going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side. (laughs) This is crazy, isn't it? How many of you, when when hardship comes, when something goes the way you don't want it to go, you're automatically like, well, I'm not going to listen to what it was preached this last Sunday because it just didn't work for me. 
I shouldn't have gone to church. It doesn't work. I should go to the other side and serve the world. It's like, just as Joshua, Moses did the same thing. The Israelites did the same thing. As soon as hardship comes, we're out of there. Folks, this is serious stuff because I think God is with us constantly and wants us to prosper and wants us to succeed and he wants us healed and he wants us delivered and he wants us to live a life walking side by side with him and he doesn't want us to stop. He doesn't want us to give up. He doesn't want us to be discouraged. He doesn't want us to to be defeated in any way because he is the one that helps us. I want us to be strong as a church. We can be unified together and conquer any wall that comes against us. Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe your name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? (laughs) This is Joshua. Do you understand we're talking about Joshua, man of faith? So every single one of us has had these moments, right? Some of you are having them now. Some of you are wondering, why do I serve this God? Some of you are like, I've been through this and I continue to go through this, but I'm gonna tell you right now, Lord, I don't see you there because God is going to deliver us his way, not our way. Here's the Lord's response, verses 10 to 12. I love this. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? (laughs) He's always got an answer, right? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart from me. And they have not only stolen them, but they have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that set apart for destruction. I want you to think about the context for us. An application for us. Is it possible that when we do things our own way, and we hide things that are sinful in our lives, that we can see the same defeat, but we also see the same God that wants to deliver us, and he wants to reveal the achens in our lives, and he still wants to break the walls down. It may not be our way, it may not be the way we think, but it is the way he does it, and when he does it, he succeeds, because he's the God of this universe that takes care of any obstacle we have, amen? But it is always God's will. This is AI. This is the thing that really, really is powerful to me. AI was always God's will. Because after Achan's sin was discovered, it says then the, in, in chapter 8 of, of Joshua, then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all the fighting men and attack AI. For I have given you the king of AI, his people, this town, and his land. I will destroy them as you destroy Jericho and its king. But this time you may keep the plunder and the livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the town. That is so powerful to me. Because here's takeaway number two. And by the way, you get all of these notes are on the after sermon notes online. So go to our website and get them, all right, with questions at the end. Takeaway number two is this. Doing things our way and presuming God's will can lead us to disaster, failure, and disappointment. Is that true? To presume means to take for granted, to assume, to suppose that sometimes we have to freshen ourselves. That's why we're talking about walking by God, walking with God by faith. Because I need a fresh anointing every day. How many of you just eat one meal a week? How many fill up your gas tank in your car just once every six months? Did you know that's really, really important? We eat because we get hungry, right? Our bodies need something. Everything needs something. But the one thing we do is we take Sunday's experience and we expect on Friday I'm going to be strong in the Lord. (laughs) 
That's why it's so important to do every single day your walk with the Lord. That every day you're reading the word, every day you're worshiping him. You're inviting him into your life. You're thinking about him. And even when you're confused, he's the answer. He's the solution. God does not always come first in our thought process, does he? Process. And we're too quick to go our own way because we're like sheep. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And of course, we go back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. How do we make our paths straight? Well, we trust in the Lord with all our hearts, right? We lean not on our own understanding. Lord, I don't understand why I have to march around Jericho another time. I don't understand why you're not releasing the wall. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get discouraged and I'm going to pull away from you and I'm just going to make sure I'm going to live my own life because you're not doing anything for me. But today, I declare that we want to live. I'm hoping every single heart in this room wants to live the life with Jesus every single day of our lives. We need to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not in yourself. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will direct your paths. I think I preach that, every, that scripture every time I preach. It is my favorite one. And you see, the power in this understanding is that I do not believe that Joshua would have failed in AI had he consulted with God first. Sometimes we do things and we don't even say, Lord, is this right? Okay? We just, we just do it. But the safest place to be is in the presence of the Lord. How can we best combat this thing about presumption and going our own way? Number one, to know the word, to study it every day. It's commanded to do that. This is the food upon which we are gonna survive in this world and in this darkness. This is a powerful thing to me. And even though I don't even have to read it because it's in here, then I can follow it. And you can plant that same word in your heart and you can follow the Lord wholeheartedly. We need to know the Spirit's voice and his movement. You know God placed that Holy Spirit in us to give us direction. How many of us know how to listen to the conscience and to be able to say, oh, I didn't, I didn't do that right. You know, when you say something to somebody and all of a sudden you feel that little tap on your shoulders. Anybody ever felt that? As soon as you say something you know you weren't supposed to say, all of a sudden now God is like tapping you on the shoulder. The difference is gonna be, do I feel it? And then what I do after that is what? I make it right. Because God doesn't want us to be entangled at all with sin. All right? Which leads us to takeaway number three. Obeying God's commands wholeheartedly involves connecting to him every day. And that's what we're talking about. Knowing him is to know his movement in our conscience, knowing his character so as to not think we know him or his will based on our own perceptions. <laughs> we, we don't think right. I don't think right. Sometimes the flesh, you know, I, I said this at the nine o'clock, but Christianity is the toughest life to live. Because it says in, you know, Paul is saying to us, the flesh wars with the spirit and the spirit wars with the flesh so that you do not do what you want to do. It's like your flesh wants to do this, the spirit says don't. The spirit wants to do this, your flesh is like, don't do that. <laughs> and it's so important to be able to get that spirit of God flowing inside of you every day so that you can be on top of your game when it comes to the Lord. Listen to me carefully. If we attempt to obey without connection, we're following God by our flesh. And what becomes, it becomes instead of obedience, it becomes obligation. God's word can become an obligation to you if you're doing it by the flesh. But listen, if you do it because you want to obey, because you honor God, because you want God's best for you, because you know he has the answers and he has the solutions to everything in your life, then guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna obey him. Isn't that fascinating? It's like what Jesus, he had problem with the Pharisees and he would, you know, he would say, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far, far from me. 
It's powerful to think that I can worship God with my lips. Today, I can worship God with my lips and I can say, praise the Lord, but then does he go with us when we leave these doors? Is he with us? All right? True obedience comes from our walk with him because what it does is it makes us want to to honor him. Our priority is to consider him. We don't question, we just act. It's like the Israelites did. They are their relationship with him. They did it because they loved the Lord. And the Ark of the Covenant went with them. And they knew that they were going to have success because God told them that was going to happen. They just had to do it his way. Not our way. Wholeheartedly. Can I tell you what happens? There's two scriptures I want to share with you. What happens when we try to follow God's will by the flesh. All right? And one of them is in Romans 7, verses 7 to 8. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would have not known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said it. You shall not covet. But this is verse 8. Listen to to me carefully. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. So in other words, if you try, you know, if you try to do it on your own, and, and this is the thing about addiction, is that so many times we try to do it on our own, and, and God's saying, you can't do it on your own. When you try to tell yourself not to do something, if you're on a diet, you might hate McDonald's, okay? But if you're on a diet, and you have had no food because you've fasted for 40 days, McDonald's actually looks pretty good. And you can compromise yourself because when you tell yourself you're not going to do something according to scripture, it actually flips it the wrong way. We need God's grace and his power of the resurrection in us to obey his word, which means we need to have a relationship with him every day. We need to walk with him by faith every day. Here's another one, Colossians 2.20. This is really powerful to me. Well, they all are, right? It's God's word. It says, since you died with Christ, verse uh, 20 and 23 of Colossians 2, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why as though you still belong to it do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have, have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and the harsh treatment of the body, but lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, if you just follow the world's rules, well, I'm going to just not do it. And as soon as you tell yourself you're not going to do it, I mean, you know, everybody's been looking at at New Year's resolutions and and diet plans, and you got all these things, and maybe it's addictions, you know, maybe it's alcoholism or drug addiction or pornography or whatever it is, but I've got to tell you right now that when you try to do it on your own, in the flesh, it will reap that benefit of that sin will come right to your face. We need the grace You have the resurrection, the power of the resurrection evident within you, but you have to put God first in everything that you do. We have to put God first in every bit of a walk. So to conclude, to finish on takeaway number three, or if they didn't change number four, listen to me carefully. Purification, holiness, setting ourselves apart and consecration are not idle commands to do if we feel like it. They are only designed to bring us to a closer walk with him. Folks, he wants that walk. He wants to be near us. We talked about that last week. The most, the greatest thing in walking with the Lord is realizing he's walking with us. (laughs) We think that he's not there, but he is there. No matter what you face, he is there. But there are things in our lives that will inhibit us from sensing that power. And that's what purification is all about. Okay? Listen to me carefully. You've all been given a card. All right? You've all been given a card. So what we want to do with that 
Because I believe that God wants us to, to eliminate anything that hinders us from full communion with him. This is the surgery, and you are squirming in your spirits right now because you're wondering, what are we gonna do with this card? What am I gonna have to put on this card? I want you to be able to look at what we, what we are doing here is looking at Achan's sin and said it affected the entire nation. And there are things in our lives that I believe God wants to get rid of. There are things he wants us to purify us from. There are things he wants us to set apart. And here's some examples. Just open and outright sin can affect us. Distractions. We're not giving God attention. Attitudes. Anger. Resentment and bitterness. Doing it not the way God wants us to be done. Unforgiveness, disobedience, doing things our own way, activities and behaviors that takes our attention from him. Folks, for me, the minute the New England Patriots have more power than God in my life, something's wrong. The Philadelphia Eagles, the Dallas Cowboys, the Philadelphia Phillies, Addictions, food, alcohol, drugs, our attitudes, gossip, malicious talk. Think about what's in our lives that hinders us from being in God's presence fully. Why is this important? Because sin affects us. When God looks at it, he's saying, please get rid of it because I want full communion with you. And we tend to resist it because I want to hold on to it. But it not only affects us, it affects a nation. When when a nation goes in the wrong way, it doesn't work right. It affects all of us. It affects our family. Try, Try doing something, having some sin in your life. Folks, marital unfaithfulness destroys not just you, it destroys the marriage and it destroys the kids. And we need God's deliverance. I need to put it away. I need to say, Lord, I want to make my heart right before you. It affects the church, doesn't it? We know how sin can affect the church. And I'm going to tell you what the devil wants to do. He wants to water it down. And he wants all all of us to be in some sin that separates us from him so that we're not effective as a church as a whole. God wants us all strong, right? He wants us strong. So I'm going to write mine. I want you to write something. Because we're all sinners, right? So I want you to go with me. I'm just going to say a short prayer. And I'm going to ask God to reveal what it is that you need to put on this. It's just a commitment. But we're going to walk with that, okay? Every day, we're going to perfect ourselves. Lord, I just pray for all of us, all our hearts right now, that are hearing what I have to say, whether we are here or online. And I pray that you would reveal to us what you want right now. Lord, let your spirit speak to us. Reveal what it is that we need to get rid of today to purify, to consecrate ourselves, to set us apart. In Jesus' name.